evening. Uh, we're privileged to have Dr. Pollock with us once again. Uh, Dr. Pollock has become an annual event at our shop and we always get great turnout and lots of great learnings and usually some good laughs and some interesting stories uh, from his uh, standpoint. And I think this year will be no different with uh, the topic that we've got uh, on schedule for tonight. Dr. Pollock used to work, as many of you know, for Divers Alert Network and is now up at the University of Laval. And has a number of roles up there, but as a chief researcher still in, in uh, the area, uh, still focused on diving and hyperbaric medicine and that kind of thing. Uh, he's been very instrumental in my own learning journey and have, have, I've watched all sorts of stuff of his as well as participated in some of these. Uh, it's a real privilege to have him here. I hope you guys enjoy our presentation uh, this evening as much as I know I will. And with that, uh, Dr. Pollock, I'm going to turn it over to you. You can give any little extra intro if you want, or you can just jump right in. Well, thanks. It's always a pleasure to be here. It's funny. I think we have been doing these for maybe pushing 10 years, yeah. and I have yet to actually physically set foot in the shop. So <laughs> one of these days, that has to happen. Yeah, that would be good. <laughs> We also had plans to go to Tobermory in February, but it didn't quite work out. But uh, one day, one day. Nice. Um, so tonight we are going to be talking about broad impact of buoyancy control and diving safety. And this is very open. So if you do have questions, I also have my chat up. So between Brad and myself, we should be able to see things if you have questions as we go. Um, but I don't think it's going to be too much hard duty tonight because I'm sure a lot of you, if you're keen enough to come to these sessions, you've probably already been thinking about buoyancy control. So let's start from there. And with the standard disclosures, I may very well talk about commercial equipment. If the questions come up, I'm happy to do so. Um, I have taken money from industry to fund research projects but it doesn't come to me and it doesn't affect my opinion. So the opinions that you're getting are mine. And as you heard Brad said, I did spend about 20 years, 19 years doing research at uh, the Hyperbaric Center at Duke University. And I was research director at Dan. And uh, about five years ago, I was recruited to come to Quebec to develop a research program in diving and hyperbaric medicine at University Laval. And what you can see on the left there is the very old chamber at Duke, 60 year old chamber. And it's beautiful because it's very flexible. It's been there long enough that um, people are happy if it gets used. On the right, you see the very pristine chamber in La Vie. And it's very definitely a different sort of feeling when you go into a place that is, is absolutely pristine. But there's really neat potential there. It's the largest civilian hyperbaric unit in Canada. And uh, we have got both the diving and the hyperbaric medicine research going. And so it's uh, a neat place to be. Okay, let's get on and talk about buoyancy control. Buoyancy is one of what I call the invisible hazards of diving. And that actually makes it very, very important. There are some things we can see and there are a lot of things we don't see. And for the things we don't see, it's very easy to underestimate their importance. And so in reality, odds are that buoyancy problems are a significant, possibly major factor in many accidents. And the real challenge is that there is virtually never going to be much forensic evidence to document that. We have a fair number of fatal events, not uh, fortunately we're we're not as high as some activities, but diving has got its risks. And when we look at cases that have happened, we're always limited by the, the evidence that's not available in diving. There's typically no evidence of decompression stress and there's no evidence of buoyancy problems. So it's incumbent upon divers to really be aware of it because you're not going to see those reminders coming out in reports because it, it just often isn't able to be confirmed. And what I would say as a statement to begin with, and I don't think there'll be much challenge here, is that good buoyancy control is very protective. It's actually, I think, possibly one of the most important skills you can have. 
I'd say maybe more important than that is the ability to clear your mask. If you uh, panic when your mask is filled, you're in, you're in bad shape. But once you have those basic skills under your belt, buoyancy control is probably the most important for your long-term health. And so I'm gonna put the hazards into three broad categories. And the first of those categories would be the physical loading. If someone has really good buoyancy control, they have less physical loading. And that by its, by its, its core nature is really critical for diving safety. So if we have someone who has either good or, or say bad, we've got a continuum here. If we have people who have bad trim and more frontal surface area, moving through the water is more work every fin kick. Someone who is really well trimmed out is going to be doing a lot less work for any movement or to fight any current. And so the advantage of that good buoyancy control and nice trim is that you have a reduction in the strain and the exertion of any dive. And for someone who's supremely fit, you may think that's not a huge burden, but we have to remember that the typical diver is not supremely fit. They may want to be and think they are, but the reality is there are very few marathoners that are doing a lot of diving. And so we have to consider that that strain and exertion can translate into fatigue that can either physically drain you or it can make you make less optimal decisions. It's very possible that being fatigued will either slow your response time or have you making decisions that aren't necessarily in your best interest. Also, we have a problem with that strain and exertion in that it bites into our reserve capacity. And this is important for every diver. We know that we need to be fit enough to dive. We need to, know, to have enough air to do the dive. But we also have to think about what happens if something goes wrong. We have to make sure that we have enough resources and enough physical capacity to meet some kind of emergent need if we want to get out of trouble. And when you have poor buoyancy control and more strain because of it, more work through the dive, you are eating into that reserve capacity, which could make the difference between a quick response to solve a problem and a slow response that could end up building the chain of negative events that ends up in a serious accident. So that's the physical loading side that, that really is important for buoyancy control. Then we've got how it affects our resource management. Someone who has poor neutral buoyancy or poor buoyancy control is going to need more gas. And that increased gas use translates into strain on your resources. And so if you have a higher utilization, you're going to have less of a supply or you're going to have to do more work to carry a bigger supply. In either case, it can affect your ability to respond in the moment and, and to perform as you need to if something goes wrong. Most people, as we know, and most dives are perfectly safe. They work out well, little things go wrong, but it's not a big deal. The concern is always to make sure you have enough reserve so that you can go from that normal, everything's pretty good dive to a really bad dive, but still have a good outcome. And that's always our goal, to try to make sure that people have good outcomes, regardless of what may go wrong during the dive. All right, the third category of hazard is, I'm calling it decompression stress, but that's actually a little bit too focused. It's really, uh, it is a focus, it's an issue of pressure change, but it's not all about decompression. If we think about someone who doesn't have the best buoyancy control, they have increased risk everywhere along the line. Their travel profile is much less controlled than it would be for the person who has good buoyancy control, and that affects you on the way down. If you rock it down too hard, if you can't control your rate of descent, you might end up overshooting your planned depth. That means you have a problem with increased in, inner gas uptake. It may be that you go deep enough and you're not able to correct your buoyancy fast enough that you have to work very, very hard to recover from it. So in the descent and bottom phase, 
we're always worried about the implication of buoyancy control or lack thereof on inert gas uptake. If we think about the ascent profile, now we've got a different situation. We need people to be going up at a rate that is appropriately controlled for whatever depth of water they're in and whatever their exposure profile was. And for someone who doesn't have really good buoyancy control, it's possible that they could miss stop depths. They could not come up at a reasonable rate and end up accruing more inert gas, or they could come up just too fast and, and have no control to begin with. We don't just worry about decompression here. We can worry about arterial gas embolism. It's possible to embolize on a normal dive, especially if you've got someone who is straining. Let's say someone is inadvertently negatively buoyant and they're working hard to ascend, even though they're negatively buoyant, it's normal for you to bear down to work a little bit harder. If you're bearing down while you're ascending, you are possibly going to be increasing the chance of gas trapping in your lungs and that can increase the risk of embolism. And so the best ascent is the one that's perfectly controlled by the diver who is not working at all. They're just cruising up. They're not putting any effort into it. And now if we look at the post dive situation, we also have an increased decompression stress. Because if you think about it, if you ended up going deeper, staying longer or coming up faster, you're in a post dive situation that's not optimal. Well, we know that almost every dive you end is going to end in exercise. You're going to get out of the water into the boat, onto the shore. Somehow you're going to be doing physical exercise. And if you planned on something that was a reasonably safe exposure, but then because of a little bit of bad luck, you went deeper, stayed longer, worked harder, whichever it might be or whatever combination it might be, you could be in a situation where your post-dive risk is elevated. And we do have fairly fixed requirements post-dive. Sure, we could drop our gear and let somebody else bring it up for us, but it's hard to bring your own Sherpa. Not very many people have Sherpas who really will pick up all their gear for them. It's reasonable to say, I'll go up without my gear and I'll come back an hour or two later to bring it up. In theory, that sounds good, but nobody really wants to leave their gear for that long. And so the post dive window is one that we want to keep as comfortable as possible because it is a place where we are very exposed. We're suffering from the, the exposure we had. And let me give you an example. We did some work at Duke for a number of years. We were developing decompression protocols for astronauts. And astronauts have to decompress when they go from the space station pressure to suit pressure. It's very similar to doing a saturation dive to 50 feet and coming straight to the surface. Your chance of decompression sickness is basically 100% if you don't do something. What they normally do is they breathe a lot of oxygen prior to the decompression, so they have very little inert gas to develop decompression sickness. We did a series of trials trying to speed their ability to get into the suit and decompress without getting DCS. And in one of the series that we did, we were looking at the impact of just walking in place. And I can't show it to you very well over the, the screen, but I want you to try to picture someone who's standing in place and just lifting a knee so the thigh is less than 90 degrees and they're just walking at a pace of step, 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 step. We had seven bouts that were, I think we were four minutes per bout. And what happened when we added just that walking in place, we went from 0% DCS to 20% DCS. And that's what you have to appreciate with post-dive exercise. Your legs in a gravity environment are supporting the entire weight of your body and they become bubble producing machines. If you have more inert gas load at the end of the dive and then you are physically working, i.e. just walking with no gear, you are increasing your likelihood of generating bubbles dramatically. 
And if you do that walking in gear, it goes up even more. Now we can do that and we do do that safely all the time, but we need to be thoughtful because everything that pushes us a little bit closer to the limit increases the risk. And we can manage that risk by doing things like having really good neutral buoyancy to reduce the uptake and to control the elimination curve and keep our reserves in good shape it all helps. So that's that, part, that's half. Oh, was there a question? That research suggests that all the parking lots need to be a lot closer to the charter boats that we're always going to, because I oh. mean, that would be, that would be one of the most obvious things. Every time you go on a charter, you're doing a hike back to your car and oftentimes with gear in tow. So oh, absolutely. it would seem that that's one of those, wow. Yeah. Didn't, didn't really. Yeah. I mean, it. The strategies you have, more and more dive boats around the world are beginning to use ladders to get people out of the, pardon me, not ladders, elevators to get people out of the water so they don't have to physically work at that point. Right. And some people will view that as being too lazy, but in fact, from a decompression point of view, that's smart. And schlepping your gear from the boat or from the shore up to the parking lot is definitely a high stress period. And it's problematic because people tend to think the dive's over i'm in good shape i can do what i want but in fact that is a a very high risk window immediately post dive you can picture yourself as the pop bottle that has just been shaken and the amount of walking you do is uh the analogy is it it correlates to how fast you're popping the top off that shaken pop bottle right and is there and a time if you're oh, sorry uh, there, is there a time when you're highest risk? Yeah, the, like I mean, if you're on the surface for an hour, let's say on the boat ride on the way back to the dock, and then you're getting off, are you are you better, or is there enough information that may oh, be known? Yeah, this is one of those questions that I like to think of it as a piece of string. How long is a piece of string? It's you can't be precise in determining the risk, but the longer you wait before post dive exercise, the safer you're going to be. Sure. So this is one of the advantages even of longer safety stops. The longer safety stop doesn't just slow down the rate of decompression. It also delays the time at which you start post-dive exercise. And yes, if you can wait for an hour, that's a great start. Is an hour a magic number? Not really. But you want to wait as long as possible before you load yourself up. Sure. And um, the if you're diving at a place where you know there's going to be post-dive exercise, the solution is to modify your dive profile so you can allow for that extra stress you're going to be feeling post-dive. You know, we're really supposed to be focusing on what can you do in the water now, but it's all tied together. Sure. The buoyancy control gives you the good foundation, but then your post-dive activity is going to be critical in determining the ultimate risk. Okay, so let's look at the half, the last half of the decompression stress side. In a way, we've we've talked about this, but different from just the, the travel profile, we also have that strain and exertion of less than optimal buoyancy control. If someone, and you can see this, you see someone who's working hard, and often it is because they're a little bit overweighted and they're kicking to maintain their position that translates into huge joint loading, joint loading burdens that can both increase your uptake of inert gas, and then later on, they can increase your risk by two things. One, they increase the shear force. When you have repetitive or high intensity joint movements, you're getting greater shear forces that can form bubble formation, that can promote bubble formation. And similarly, the uptake itself is increasing the risk of bubble formation downstream. So the goal that we need to have is to do what we can without spoiling our fun. You know, not, I'm not saying you don't dive, I'm saying dive, but do what you can to minimize the inert gas uptake and then make sure that you can reduce shear forces and minimize the risk of bubble formation post dive or towards the end of the dive. And if you can do that, you can reduce the burden quite a bit. So you have to think about these things in buoyancy control. And so that's the, the, the schematic, which um, can work for some people, but let's just think of some practical examples. 
This is a dive profile of a diver who, it's not an extreme dive. It's a dive to a little over 60 feet or yeah, 63 feet and initial bottom time of about 37 minutes. But then you can see the diver went straight to the surface. Well, if you go straight to the surface, it's good that this diver went to the surface on this dive because there wasn't an obligatory bad ending. It was still reasonable enough that they could do that quick surface without a problem. But they overshot, went to the surface, came back down to solve the problem, carried on the dive again, but then started to ascend again and again shot up to the surface, came back down, tried to finish the dive. And at the very end, you can see still shot up to the surface. So here we have a definitely suboptimal profile. On the bottom, they did pretty well, but these jumps to the surface, whether they're because of inability to control a buoyant ascent or whether it's a, a choice, let's say the diver gets lost and figures they have to see where they're going, this can create a tremendous amount of physiological stress on you. And so the better way to do it, if we had the choice, would be to maintain that good buoyant status throughout the dive and progressively travel more and more slowly as we approach the surface, not these bullet type of sense. So this one should make sense to people that it doesn't, it's not optimal. And it's not necessarily a problem of excess buoyancy, but it certainly can be. This is another example where buoyancy control can be critical. Here you have a deeper dive. This dive has a maximum depth of 131 feet. And the red block is showing you the decompression obligation. The diver intended to come up and leave a vertical buffer between their depth and the ceiling that the decompression algorithm said that they should not exceed. But because of some challenges with buoyancy, ended up coming very close to that ceiling and corrected and came back down. But this is an example where a little bit of a slip in your buoyancy control can make a problem for you. Now, again, this diver didn't go all the way to the surface, came back down fairly quickly to correct, but this is not the kind of profile you want to see. What you really hope for is that people can control their profile throughout the dive and the ascent. So if they plan to maintain a vertical buffer between their depth and the ceiling that's established by the algorithm, they will do so under control. Now, just to give a plug for this dive, the nice thing about this dive, the diver spent a lot of time in the shallow water before finally servicing at a slow rate. And this shallow time, stop time, is really critical to reduce the overall decompression stress. There is no better advantage for decompression safety than extra shallow stop time. Deep stops are not beneficial, but extra shallow stop time is solid. So this is a really good profile, other than the fact that the diver transiently lost a little bit of control and broke his intended plan. And no big surprise, we see this all the time. The trick is to make sure we're mindful of all the hazards to make sure that the, the cumulative risk isn't so much that it puts us over the edge. Okay. So what are the challenges to buoyancy control? Well, there are several things we should think about. And, and the first is the impact of the equipment configuration. Now, a lot of people think about the difference between open and closed circuit systems. There is a difference in buoyancy control between the two. And if you're a long time open circuit diver and you suddenly take up closed circuit rebreather diving, you can feel like a novice again because your, your buoyancy control is horrible. It's just such a massive difference. When you're approaching the rock on open circuit and you want to go above the rock, you just inhale. You float up above the rock and then when you're past it, you exhale and you go down. In a closed circuit system, as you're approaching the rock and you inhale, you run face first into the rock. Because you're breathing in and out of a bag, it's not doing anything to change your buoyancy control. So there are significant differences between the open and closed circuit systems. And at first they can seem insurmountable, but they are very manageable with time, but it does take time and experience. The next hazard we have is weighting norms or what I have in brackets, overweighting norms. And I'm going to argue that the majority of divers, and I'm going to say that I'm going to challenge everybody in this group 
I'm willing to bet that almost every diver listening to this presentation tonight could probably cut some weight off their belt without uh, having a problem carrying out the dive. Most divers dive overweighted. And so we'll be talking about examples there. The next issue is ballast weight placement. And ballast weight placement issues have really been made greater by the fact that the manufacturers want to sell us, they want to build whatever we will buy. And people say, hey, I get lower back pain. I hate wearing a weight belt. What can you do about it? And before you know it, you've got a BCD that will have six different weight pockets to spread your weight all over. And that solves one problem, but it creates another problem. So we'll get back into this in a little more, bit more detail. The wet versus the dry suit. Mostly a problem for the person who's first transitioning to a dry suit, there's much greater fear in using the dry suit. It does affect your buoyancy control and your comfort. It's manageable with experience, but um, it's certainly a hazard. And again, all of these things I'm going to be giving you examples of. And the last thing we'll talk about is multiple systems for buoyancy control. This is an increasing problem as divers get more complicated gear structures. So that's the equipment configuration challenge. Then we have the skill. And for skill, I really want to make the distinction between skill and experience. One of my favorite lines, and I have no idea who, who first described it, is that a diver who has been diving for 30 years can have one year of experience 30 times, or they can have 30 years of experience. It really can go both ways. Just because you've been certified for a long time or even have a fair number of dives doesn't actually necessarily mean that you have the skill. And so skill is critical in buoyancy control and it's not necessarily a given by the time people have been certified. And then the last category that can challenge buoyancy control is anything that impairs situational awareness. And I have as examples, poor visibility in water action. We probably all here if have not experienced areas where you can have strong currents or even downwelling or upwelling currents. And those can play great havoc on the buoyancy control. So those are all factors we have to think about. And let's just look at some practical examples. With the open and closed circuit systems, you can develop rock solid neutral buoyancy with both of them. It's a lot easier with open circuit systems but the, one of the things that a lot of closed circuit divers do is they approach trim with a religious ferocity and they do everything they can to optimize their trim. And this is good because not only does it allow them to work less, it also can optimize their breathing to reduce static lung load, to reduce the strain of breathing, which reduces other risks. Not just decompression, it reduces the risk of immersion pulmonary edema it reduces a lot of the risk that is inherent in underwater diving. And so you can get buoyancy control in both systems, but you have to work for it, particularly in the closed circuit systems. Now here are pictures of people who are a little bit less controlled. Again, both open circuit and closed circuit. The person on the right is hovering pretty well, but using his hands to hold that position. We've all done that or seen people do it. And the person on the, on the right is trying to stay in the right frame for the picture, but is clearly a little bit too positively buoyant and is trying to work to hold that position. And the natural response, again, in this position is to exhale to try to correct your position, but that doesn't work in closed circuit. What happens instead, because she's tilted head down, when she exhales into the counter lung and then inhales, it's very likely that she's going to be depressing her a valve that dumps extra gas into the loop because all the gas is at the bottom of the counter lungs, not at the top where that valve assembly is. And so it can become quite a bit of a worsening problem when you start to get out of, a, out of trim in a rebreather. Once you're head down, it's really hard to correct because if you have a, an ADV, an automatic diluent valve, it automatically dumps gas in if it thinks you need it. And that can be a problem. 
So we're not going to get into the specifics of this, but you definitely have more work to do in a rebreather system. But once you peg your buoyancy control, it's not that much different a feeling than it is for your open circuit. You just have to be willing to be a novice again to get to that point. Okay, so let's talk about overweighting because this really is a huge problem. And it's a huge problem from the beginning because I will say that most students learn to dive overweighted. If you realistically look at most scenarios, even in the pool, but definitely in open water, when you've got a number of students and one is having trouble getting down, you could spend a lot of time trying to make sure they're, they're fully optimized, but often what is done instead is extra weight is put on them. And the problem with that response of overweighting novices is that divers begin to associate that extra weighted position as being normal. And so they never learn to dive neutrally buoyant because they have literally been trained to dive overweighted. And this could be corrected if towards the end of the training program, a real focus was put on trying to reduce the weight worn. But in most cases that's missed. And even if it's not missed, once people leave the class, often they don't want to change too much in their gear because they don't want to possibly make things worse. And you can find some divers who will dive for many years overweighted simply because that's how they learned. That was their normal case. And so we have to do a better job on the instructional side to control this. We really have to stop overweighting divers. And so that's the solution. We really need to do a better job of prioritizing neutral buoyancy from the outset. And this is hard when you first start training, but if you can, from the beginning, practice midwater skills, you can start to improve people's buoyancy control. It is a bit of a nightmare in the beginning, but it will produce a much better diving. You also have to really imbue the sense of waiting vigilance. And this is something that you should be evaluating really on every dive. Someone who is acutely tuned into their buoyancy control will appreciate a difference of as little of, as half a pound of ballast weight. They can feel whether they're underweight, overweight, or perfectly weighted. And that's what we need to do in all divers. We need to have them more attuned to what is optimal so they can understand when they're overweighted. Because again, I'll challenge each of you. When you go diving next, try to drop a little bit of weight and see if it hinders you. And I am willing to bet that most people could drop a pound or two and sometimes a whole bunch more and not have any negative effects on their diving. That means they're diving overweighted and that is a problem. So we want to reinforce waiting vig vigilance as an ongoing target. It never ends. You change a little bit of equipment, you have to consider changing your weighting. You change the temperature of water you're diving in, your buoyancy is going to change a little bit. You change the undergarments, it all changes. So we really need to be evaluating on every dive. But we know we're going to carry weight. So the next question is, what the hell do we do with it? And weight distribution is an interesting question. And if this was a live session, I'd be trying to, to get you to weigh in, but it's a little bit more difficult on the call. So I'll just jump to it. When you ask people about their priority, if it comes down to a question of comfort or safety, often people prioritize comfort. They don't think it's compromising their safety, but often decisions are made regarding waiting based on comfort, not based on what is safest. And so for comfort, people may want to use negatively buoyant tanks because that gets that weight belt off their waist because that weight belt seems to give them lower back problems. They may go to multiple distribution points because that allows them to be a lot more comfortable with that weight off their belt. And there is good logic from a comfort point of view for this, but there is a real hazard that's created by this. And if you want to check yourself, you should do what I call the efficacy test. And that is go into the water with any weight and equipment configuration that is normal for you 
and then empty all of the gas out of the systems. So if you're running a, a wetsuit, empty it out of the BC. If you're running a dry suit and a buoyancy compensator, empty the gas out of the dry suit and the BC. And then the trick is to keep your head above water for as long as you can. And if you can't keep your head above water fairly easily, you are at significant risk. And I know when I started diving years ago, I was an air hog. And so the first thing myself and my buddy did, we went out and bought uh, large tanks. We got 94.7 cubic foot steel tanks because we wanted the extra air. Because for us, of course, the only reason to dive was to, to go deep and to be some kind of hero. Um, I was very young when I started diving. Um, well, I had that configuration until I started my instructor course. And on day one of the instructor course, we had to get into the pool, empty our BCs and support our tanks. And I'd been a competitive swimmer for a lot of years. And I had a hard time holding up that tank with the BC empty. I sold the tank the next day because I finally realized that this was not a good strategy. If I can't hold this up easily, then I am at risk. And so try that. If you don't believe it, try it and see if you can keep your head above water comfortably. It's not about keeping it up marginally. You really want to be able to be safe at the surface if you have weight that you cannot ditch. And so the recommendation is you should always make sure that you have easily ditchable weight that will allow you to comfortably pass that efficacy test. And I'm not saying marginally, I'm saying you can dump enough weight so that you can easily keep your airway clear of the water with no other air in your system. Or if it's a rebreather with your loop flooded, which is the worst case scenario uh, in terms of buoyancy, when you introduce water to the loop, you lose more buoyancy. And then if you're not able to ditch that weight, you're in a very, very bad way because those rebreathers tend to be attached to your body fairly, fairly firmly. And it's not that quick and easy to get out of them. Uh, there was a fatality in um, Florida now, a couple of years ago now, a diver who was diving a rebreather had a habit of jumping into the water with his loop out of his mouth and he put the loop in, in the water. And I think he did it as a way to practice his skills when he entered the water. But on this day, he didn't have the mouthpiece closed. And so he jumped in the water and the loop flooded. He lost buoyant support and he started to sink and he couldn't correct it fast enough and he ended up drowning. And that's a, a bad scenario, but it is not at all hard to imagine. Okay. So now back to the comment of how do we get rid of the lower back pain that got people away from weight belts to begin with? In the water, we have one of the best solutions going. If you have anybody who complains of lower back pain because of their weight belt, while they're underwater, all they have to do is go into, tuck into a ball, grab their knees, tuck into a ball and hold that position for 10 or 15 seconds, once or twice. And in most cases, that back pain is alleviated. We're supported by the water. We can easily move into that tuck and that will often alleviate the back pain. And if we can help people do that and get them to realize that weight belts aren't the enemy, we have them for a reason. It's so we can ditch them when we need to. And the, the options are simple to me. Where is it easier to survive without breathing apparatus, underwater or at the surface? If the answer is at the surface, um, the ability to get to the surface and maintain yourself there really is a huge safety benefit. Okay, let's go back to dry suits. Dry suits do concern people with buoyancy. It makes them nervous, throws them off. And it is different. Rather than having the air moving the length of the BC, you have the air potentially moving the entire length of the body. And this really flips people out when they first experience that. Everybody is concerned with having their feet filled with air and losing um, the ability to control their fins. But we have to remember that we can control that through a couple of things. So just a few points here. One, you can't ever make major changes with a dry suit until you get used to it. Some people do get used to them in one dive, but I have actually seen the most extreme in my experience is somebody who took literally 16 dives before gaining comfort with the dry suit. And the end was still good, solid comfort, but it can take time to get comfortable. 
what you have to remember though, that if you want to avoid the risk of inversion and thin blow off, one of the first things to do is to avoid overweighting. We have more air in that suit when we're overweighted. We have to compensate for it because that's ballast weight that's dead weight. And if you were wearing less weight to begin with, you would need less air in the dry suit at any point in time, and that reduces the risk of, of fin blow off. And so we're really back to weighting as being a, a huge solution. And some people say, well, I'm going to wear ankle weights because that way it's more comfortable. I have less weight on my belt and I've got this tight strap on my ankle. And so air won't go to the feet. First off, air will go to the feet. That ankle weight isn't quite as effective as you think. And number two, that's not ditchable weight. So those are two things against it. And there's a third thing against it. And that is that it creates a huge energetic demand when you need to have minimal energetic demands. And let me show you a picture for that. This is a diver who is uh, in cold water. That's actually an ice wall. Um, I'm actually the diver in this case. This is the Antarctic. That's a 60 foot ice wall behind me. And so Brad, you were talking about good visibility. In the Antarctic, you've got nominal visibility of 800 feet. And so it's like diving in the clearest water imaginable. You go from here to the tropics and you think, eh, visibility's okay. It really spoils you for life. But the water's cold, minus two degrees C. And so you definitely are wearing dry suits. And a lot of people down there initially will start off thinking that ankle weights are the way to go because we're often wearing a lot of weight on belts. But you have to think about your center of gravity as a diver. Center of gravity is pretty much right where that weight belt is. And if you put an ankle weight about 30 inches from that center of gravity, you're creating a moment arm that's huge. And what I mean when I say that, if everything is going well, it doesn't matter. But let's say an emergent event happened. You have to rescue yourself or rescue someone else. When you've got a 30 inch moment arm between the center of mass and that two or three pound weight, every kick you are multiplying that load on your body. And so you are working really, really hard, potentially at a time when you need to conserve every bit of energy you have to make sure you can get out of trouble quickly. And so the huge problem with ankle weights is that they are disproportionately loading you far beyond what happens when it's on a weight belt. And so if you wanted to get the same benefit without the downside, put the damn weight back on your belt and then wear a tight strap around your ankle. That will do as much good as the ankle weight and it won't have a huge downside of the ankle weight. Now, I would like to believe that ankle weights have gone away because they just don't make sense physiologically, but there's still a lot of people who like them. And I say to people who feel that way, try it without for 10 dives and see what happens. Because most people I know who dive with ankle weights will admit that more than once they've jumped into the water without the ankle weights and the world hasn't ended. The dive wasn't horrible and they did pretty well. They didn't even notice. That tells me two things. One, they're overweighted to begin with because they could ditch all that weight without even feeling it. And two, they don't need the ankle weights at all. And so if people wear ankle weights, and I'm sorry, Brad, if you sell a lot of ankle weights, I'm definitely not going to be a proponent, but. Uh, it's all good. We probably use them more in the pool to try and keep people's fins on the ground when we're doing fin pivots. It's not so much for open water stuff. And, and to me, I would still, I think that one of the best ways to maintain the skill or learn the skill, the control, is to do it manually. Like some people say, oh, my fins are so buoyant, I can't control them. But we know when we see experienced people that the buoyancy of those fins is not a problem. So I get it, but I bet you'd have better outcomes in the long term if you never use the ankle weights. Okay, so what are our buoyancy control options with dry suits? Well, we know in modern diving, it's normal to pe for people to add a buoyancy compensator with a dry suit. This is smart. Neck seals can fail, wrist seals can fail, zippers can fail. It's nice to have a backup. An ongoing debate that comes up time and time again is which should be primary, 
the BCD or the suit. And I'm sure people have different opinions, but I'm gonna give you my position on this. And it often comes back to the basics. We have to think about the fundamentals. We know that to avoid squeezes in the dry suit, some gas has to be added to the dry suit as we descend. That's just, if you want to avoid a suit squeeze and you want to avoid leaks, which will happen if you let the suit be taken down and no pressure, your next seal often won't work as well. Um, we will, we need to add some air to the suit. That's number one. Number two, it is logical that juggling two systems for buoyancy control is more troublesome, especially if things get complicated. If there are emergent events or some kind of problem, it is really difficult if you have to manage two systems. And for that reason, the, the decision is easy for me. I know I have to add air to one. Why not only use that one? And then I am minimizing the complication and minimizing the risk, but I still have a backup. So the recommendation I would make is use the dry suit as the primary buoyancy control device underwater, and then use the BCD as backup underwater or as primary on the surface. And the reason for primary on the surface is simple. Most people's neck seals are not too tight, which is logical, it makes them comfortable. They tend to burp at a certain point. And we did a study years ago, actually, this was a study that was published in 1989. And we looked at, at where you lost buoyancy in a dry suit. And of the suits we tested, at about 13 pounds positive buoyancy, that, that next seal would burp. And so if you're not able to get much more than 13 pounds of positive buoyancy out of next seal, and even if it's a little more, a little bit less, you need a secondary supply. So on the surface, it makes good sense to use your BCD as primary and not rely on your dry suit. But underwater, for safety and management issues, it makes sense to use the dry suit alone. Now, some people have raised the argument of, oh, I don't want to put stress on my dry suit, it'll fail earlier. If you have a dry suit that can't tolerate the air you have to put in for buoyancy control, you need a better dry suit. Um, dry suits are actually, many of them can be made very well. That stress should not be any kind of killer on a dry suit. Okay, so how do we evaluate buoyancy control? And every instructor, I'm not sure how many people are instructors or dive masters or what your status is, but let's just think of some quick things you can do to evaluate buoyancy control. Looking at trim and attitude are key. You can see someone either still or moving, you really can get a good idea of their buoyant control by how well they can maintain trim without working for it. Now you have to watch them carefully because occasionally they'll do everything they need to do while your back is turned and then they'll be as still as possible um, when you turn around. And I'll give you a good example for that. We had a dive medicine course in Bermuda and I jumped into the water one day and uh, I forgot my dry suit. It was on the boat. There was no way in the world I was going to admit to forgetting my weight belt on the boat. So I did the dive without the weight belt. Fortunately, it was pretty light. But every time anybody looked at me, I made sure I was absolutely still. And then as soon as they turned their back, I'd be grabbing rocks or exhaling or do whatever, do whatever I had to do to uh, maintain my position. It was one of those moments that un unbelievably nobody caught on. But, uh, you know, that's, what, that's when pride gets in the way when you do silly things. But I'm sharing it with you. So it's out there. Economy is another thing that uh, we can use to evaluate the buoyancy control. We want the most streamlined position, so we're not working hard to fight the currents. So we have the lowest drag coefficient possible, and we're either not working as hard to fight the current, um, or we can move a little bit faster with less strain in still water. We also can benefit from good buoyancy control because it's... It's easy if we can maintain ourselves so we can see our partners, we can monitor them while having, without having to turn around. And if you see that, that's probably somebody who's in pretty good control. And the other thing that's a good sign, if you see someone who always seems to move as fast or faster than somebody else without seemingly kicking their feet much, that's probably because they have really good buoyancy control. If you've got someone who's overweighted, they will be using a lot more thin kicks for everything they do, and that's where that strain comes in. 
We also can look at the proximity of divers. There are two types of divers who don't get their head into the bottom to really look at things. One, it's those who require prescription masks and they tend to stay back because they can't see anything that close. And the second is people who have very poor buoyancy control. People with really good buoyancy control are willing to hover, to float right in, to look at something because they have that exquisite control. And if they're not willing to get close, often it's because they have less control. And so we don't have to, we don't have to tell people when we're evaluating them, but it's always good to know who you're diving with and to know yourself. And so these are some things that may help to evaluate buoyancy control. Now, economy is critical. The person who's got really good economy of diving is going to be making their life so much easier in normal dives and emergent events. And the buoyancy control is a big part of this. And it's not the only thing. We talked about reducing drag. We want to eliminate unnecessary movements. And we do that more effectively if we're neutrally buoyant. If, as in the story I told you, uh, someone diving without a weight belt when they needed one, you're doing an awful, awful lot of hand motion to try to maintain your position. If we're properly weighted, we don't have the extra motion. We can orient ourselves to monitor the buddy so we don't have to turn the heads. We've got a more efficient kick and we can just ride with the water currents. This is optimally the best way to dive. Rather than fighting the water, ride the currents, move with the ebb and flow of the surge if you're in surge and use the water to your advantage. So where do we go on summarizing all this? The goal tonight was to try to talk about the problems with poor buoyancy control or the benefits of excellent neutral buoyancy. And really, if we focus on the positive, the benefits, it reduces the physical loading dramatically in normal events and in emergent events. It reduces the strain, which helps you both from an energetics point of view and from a decompression point of view. So it reduces the strain on your reserves and it really does reduce the overall decompression stress. And Ultimately, what makes each dive safe is usually not one thing. It's a combination of a bunch of little factors. And if we can adjust as many little factors as possible in our favor for safety, we can have incident-free dives that still allow us to do everything we want to do with them. And that, of course, is the hope. Thank you very much. Well, thank you. I see some claps there. Uh, <clears throat> there, um, I just asked if anybody had some questions. Thank you, Dr. Pollock. That was actually really quite interesting. And uh, and for some of us on the call, maybe we've heard some of this before. And, and there are others that are, uh, I'm going to say, newer in the diving game, that some of this would be either not new, but reinforced stuff that we we teach, you know, we, we actually don't. So, you know, we, we really rarely use ankle weights at all. You know, there's a pair usually in the save a dive kit somewhere in case somebody really needed them. But, but uh, we, we do exactly what you said, which is try and train them without them. So uh, that tends to work better. Um, yeah, and I, you're absolutely right that this, a lot of this material shouldn't be new to people who've been around, but it still amazes me how I'll go to new areas and you'll see clusters of people, for example, with ankle weights. Um, in Quebec, for example, there are a lot of people who are pretty religious about their ankle weights. And um, so it's still worth having these conversations, I think, because divers tend to travel and when they meet other groups, they can meet someone who says, hey, you should try these neat things, these ankle weights, they're fantastic. And somebody who hasn't had the conversations may very well not see any problem with them. So uh, definitely we're not doing anything new here, but hopefully we can promote some conversation. Sure, um, I got a couple questions rolling in, uh, in particular with uh, technical diving, for example, a lot of people have said, well, I, I got doubles on, I'm not wearing any weight at all. So I really don't have ditchable weight. Somebody else said something similar about side mount. Um, if people that, aren't wearing weight, does that mean, uh, I'll sort of paraphrase, does that mean I should have smaller doubles and ditchable weight? Or is this more a, 
oh, I should have a lift bag with adequate lift so that I could stay on the surface. Is there a... Yeah. Yeah, for me, I have a, a very strong position on this. More and more people, and I certainly see this a lot in Quebec, which is one of the reasons to talk about this, that people like bigger and bigger steel tanks that are very heavy. There are a number of people who think that they're winning if they can get a tank that's 14 pounds negative when it's full. And um, that to me is a problem. To say I don't wear ditchable weight means to me that there is an equipment configuration problem. And so, yes, I'd say you should be using a tank that is much closer to neutral so you can put some ditchable weight on it. The idea of having a lift bag that can support you at the surface, that's well and good at the surface, but what happens if you lose your buoyancy while you're well underwater? That lift bag is going to be an awful cumbersome way to try to correct a problem in buoyancy. And so I, I am a firm believer that you can configure most technical equipment so you have a substantial amount of ditchable weight. With my rebreather, I try to make sure I've always got 12 to 14 pounds of ditchable weight. And the one time I can't do that is if it's warm tropical water and there's zero suit, then it's tough because you're, there's nowhere to go. But in cold water, you typically have lots of options for um, cylinder configurations and, and back plates. A lot of people will go out of their way, not only to have negatively buoyant tanks, they try to have negatively buoyant steel back plates. And they are actively putting the weight everywhere but the belt. I'd say you could compromise and put some of the weight back on the belt so you can ditch enough to get out of trouble. Cool. Anybody else have any other questions? Uh, Brad, it's David here. I have a question. Yeah, shoot. Uh, Dr. Pollock, you... Um... Beginning of your presentation, you talked about the timing of exercise and um, trying to defer that as much as possible. You also wrote an article that was recently published on the timing of exercise and diving. My question is just on clarity. Is that all on intensity as far as joints or is that also an intensity when it comes to heart rate? Well, that's a good question. It's, it's unclear that heart rate alone is um, a good metric that we can rely on because your heart rate can be elevated for a number of reasons. And when you're in the water, your heart rate is reduced. Um, so it's really about overall loading. And the way to measure it is to think about your breathing effort. If someone is breathing heavier than a normal resting ventilation, they're working harder. So heart rate is probably not as much of a concern just because there are variables that affect it. The worst thing in terms of, of exercise is high joint loading. So anything that involves really high joint forces is a problem, but exercise of any type can be problematic. So if I'm understanding that correctly, doing a cardio workout on an elliptical is better than doing a cardio workout on a treadmill after a dive. Um, yes, but both are bad. Okay. Yes, if you want to choose between exercises, the exercise that have the, has the lower joint forces is the better, best option. And I can, let me give you an example here. We did a, um, a research trip, it was a few years ago now, and this was um, collecting fish from 300 foot depths. So each day was a single dive to 300 to 350 feet. And one diver in the group was a hardcore triathlete. This fellow was in beautiful shape and he was training for a triathlon, even though he was on this month long trip. And so he was trying to separate his diving from his workout as best he could. So he would get up and exercise at four o'clock in the morning. And then they would typically dive at about 10 or 1030 in the morning. And he felt that removed the two as far as possible. Even though he was young and easily the fittest person in the group, he was scoring the highest bubble scores every day. And finally, after trying to do everything we could to reduce his bubble scores, he agreed to take one day off his training program. He took one day off his training program and his bubble scores dropped down to zero. And his exercise was on a cycle ergometer. And so that's better than the treadmill because there are lower joint forces but it still has a lot of joint loading and it still is a burden. 
And because of that, even though his diving was separated from his exercise, he was bubbling hot, very hot. So simple rule of thumb is you should not be doing a meaningful dive and exercise on the same day if you can avoid it. There is no magic number. So whether you're waiting 16 hours or 14 hours, it, it, it becomes impossible to differentiate. But as a general rule, if you're doing a dive with significant decompression stress, you shouldn't be on the elliptical or the treadmill or really the bike um, at high intensity uh, on the same day, if you can possibly avoid it. And I know it's difficult for people who want to train and they want to dive. The reality is high intensity exercise is actually incompatible with decompression safety. Thank you, that's very helpful. There was another uh, question or comment here about, uh, does, the in, does this information change the way people are taught regarding holding their breath at surface, water at eye level? This is sort of the standard sort of weight check. But then I know like when I've watched the Patty dry suit video, for example, it says do that and then add four to five pounds or two to three kilos or whatever to compensate for the air that won't be in your tank at the end of the dive, which seems kind of silly. We're doing a weight check at the beginning, not in the optimal time, because we want to know that we're buoyant at the safety stop or whatever. So does this sort of change how we might want to do weight checks? That's a great question. I actually believe that weight checks should be at the end of the dive. Remember I said somebody who's exquisitely sensitive to their buoyancy control they will be aware if they're a half a pound or more over or under. And it's at the end of each dive, you say, hey, you know, I was overweighted or I was a little underweighted. I'm going to compensate next time. So you do the best you can with the pre-check, but it is really difficult um, to do that eye, floating at eye level in a meaningful way. And I'll give you another story about this. We use hydrostatic weighing to look at body composition of people. You put them in a tank, they sit on a swing and they have to exhale all of their gas and then we measure their weight in water. And from that, we can determine their body density. We had one woman who is in really good shape and she kept coming out with 80% body fat. And we just, you know, the students who were doing this couldn't figure out what the hell the problem was. Well, the problem was she was afraid of water. And so she couldn't empty her lung for the test. And so she was maintaining a full-ish lung. And so it made it look like she was much less dense than she was. And that's not dissimilar to some novices when they're in open water. You can tell them to exhale fully and often they won't. So the problem with the, the check for me, one check doesn't do anything. I think you have to have continual monitoring of buoyancy, of waiting for buoyancy control. And you get pretty close the first time, and then you're constantly revising it to make it perfect. Yeah, one of the uh, one of the other people had sort of had some private chat stuff going on. And they said, "Well, how do I test that? You know, without you know uh, wrecking my safety stuff?" And the suggestion was, "Well, hey, when you go and do that pool dive, or you do that dive in our local quarry that's only 20 feet deep, at the end of the dive." drain your tank to 500 PSI when you have no yep. obligatory safety stop. The worst thing that's going to happen is you do a uh, up to the surface, you lost 15 feet, but you have no real obligations and no massive uh, yep. decompression. Stress. And you can do it even after it's completely done. You know, once you're done your safety stop, go to the surface, you can add or take off weight and then go back down. Yeah, it's, right. it's, it's easy to do it, but you're absolutely right. We, we do have to be have enough gas so we can do those obligatory or safety stops, but we want hopefully to not have any more than that amount of weight. And that's always iterative. This is the problem in most training scenarios. Instructors understandably want a quick solution so the dive can continue. And the solution is often just to throw weight on people because that allows them to get down and it puts off the problem until tomorrow. But it is a tomorrow problem when we teach people to dive overweighted. We really need to make them more conscious of good buoyancy control and good neutral buoyancy. Cool. Any other questions? From folks. I, uh, I found it fascinating just, uh, 
I had not heard the statistics before about things as simple as walking after a dive and the uh, risk that that, the incremental risk that that provides. I, I, I must say though, I, I have dove with Rick Stanley out in Newfoundland a couple of times. There's a few people on this call. He does have one of those lifts on his boat and it's beautiful. <laughs> That is one of the best oh, yeah. inventions ever. I, I can tell you. That's awesome. And, and you know, and the only problem is even when you're on that lift, once you're out of the water, you're still taking all that weight onto your legs sure. and you're walking off that lift. So the lifts are good, but they're not the end of the story. Yeah, it's not a you, panacea. You still have to, sadly, we have to fight gravity all the time. So you're saying we need like a conveyor belt to get us out of the water back into our cars, load everything yeah. ourselves, and then just drive us home. I think, Alex, you have the right solution. A conveyor belt <laughs> assembly would be the way to go. And it mind. should have water-filled seats, so and they should be warm, because it's also shown that if you're in a, a, a supine position in warm water, you will augment your inert gas elimination optimally. And so let's go all the way. Yeah, right. belt I want to with see this dive boat. Yeah. Little I'm warm for Alex. Alex, you need Gets you right into a boat. bathtub. You're just chilling. <laughs> That's great. Yeah. A few comments there about, oh, great argument for concierge diving, right? Get get the people hauling your gear and looking after. Now, mind you, that's the dive master that's also been with you on the dive. So oftentimes it, it might be putting them at greater risk and not, not yourself, but uh, amen. That's yeah, well, it's true. Con concierge diving has its place. It's I I. It has its place. Certainly for people who either don't have the capacity or they feel they're on the edge, there are real advantages. Yeah. I like to build in the safety factor so you don't need to rely on it. But right. um, yeah, you can go good. either way. Very good. Very good. Well, thank you also for addressing some of the things like uh, overweighting being a big issue. It's, it's always good to hear about that because we're always trying to, I know even for myself personally, I'm always trying to peel off a little bit of extra uh, weight, uh, see if I can do it in, in new environments as I've gained experience over the years. And also for addressing the suit versus BCD question. That's one that we get asked a lot. So it was nice to hear uh, your thoughts on that as well. I think that's fairly, your thoughts are fairly consistent with how most of us dive as well. Um, and I know there are probably some dives where the deeper I get, I must, I almost have to use a little bit of my BCD because my dry suit just gets unruly large. Uh, but it'll usually be the last gas that I put in into the BCD and the first gas that I dump out just to minimize what you talked about, which was those complications of multiple things at the same time. So, and, and now depending on how deep people are, if they're not carrying any excess weight, normally you shouldn't have a huge volume in that, in that suit, but it's true. If you're going really deep there, there comes a point when you might have to use your, your BCD, but for the typical recreational diver, they, if they have to go to two support system, they should be looking at whether or not they could reduce some weight. Yeah, mine would be mostly technical stuff and would be fairly deep. So I, yeah, cool, good. Anybody else have any last minute comments or questions? Well, I appreciate the comment from Samantha saying uh, we'll be rethinking her doubles configuration. I hope you do because I, I'll tell you, we dive. I don't know if any of you've been in in uh, Les Escamain or or the Fjord, the Saguenay. Um, black water, lots of current, and it really can be awkward conditions. And when you're diving with people who are wearing doubles, double steels that are, and they have no weight belt whatsoever, man, that's, it's just unimaginable to have to think about having to do a rescue, even a self-rescue in those conditions. Hmm. So Samantha, if you really rethink it, I'll, I'll call this a win. There you go. But we've got a class tomorrow night, so it should be yeah, interesting. Just, I was just going to say, uh, I've got, got a class tomorrow night. I've been diving doubles for a couple of years, um, but uh, I'm going to be harassing Brad and uh, Dave tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> Good. Hey, it's, if I can cause trouble, that's even, that's a double win. <laughs>
<laughs> there you go. Score. <laughs> Score. I don't know. I'm proud happy to man. inviting you back next year. <laughs> well done. That's all good. That's awesome. Well, listen, thank you very much, Dr. Pollock, for joining us again. I really appreciate you taking the time to come out and help with some, some education, some fun, uh, some learning with our dive group. It's, it's really nice to have uh, some other folks in the industry share their experience and their knowledge with us. And uh, on behalf of everybody that was on the call tonight, we had uh, 30 or so folks. Uh, on behalf of everybody, I, I want to say you know, a great big thank you to you. Uh, I, I can't wait to see what next year has in store. There's always a, a good one and uh, really appreciate it. And we will be looking forward to the day that you manage to come down and step foot in the shop. We'll, uh, we'll invite everybody and they can come and say hello to you in person. <laughs> come for a barbecue or something. All right. All right. Well, terrific. Well, thank you very much, everybody. Really appreciate everybody being here. If anybody needs a copy of the slide or whatever, uh, Dr. Pollock has graciously said it's okay. We're going to post the recording of this session up on the website on the events page. So if there's anything that you wanted to see or, or relook or whatever, you'll be able to do that um, in a couple of days. Terrific. Well, thank you, everybody. Great to see you all. And take care. We'll see you soon. Right on. Thanks again. Take care. You bet.